four men were dragging Loder's body away and the crowd was dispersing quietly. Reacher was left standing on the courthouse steps with his six guards and Fowler. Fowler had finally unlocked the handcuffs. Reacher was rolling his shoulders and stretching. He had been cuffed all night and all morning and he was stiff and sore. His wrists were marked with red wheels where the hard metal had bitten down. Cigarette, Fowler asked. He was holding his pack out. A friendly gesture. Reacher shook his head. I want to see Holly, he said. Fowler was about to refuse, but then he thought some more and nodded. Okay, he said. Good idea. Take her out for some exercise. Talk to her. Ask her how we're treating her. That's something you're sure to be asked later. It'll be very important to them. We don't want you giving them any false impressions. Reacher waited at the bottom of the steps. The sun had gone pale and watery. Wisps of mist were gathering in the north. But some of the sky was still blue and clear. After five minutes, Fowler brought Holly down. She was walking slowly, with a little staccato rhythm as her good leg alternated with the thump of her crutch. She walked through the door and stood at the top of the steps. Question for you, Reacher, Fowler called down. How far can you run in a half hour with a hundred and twenty pounds on your back? Reacher shrugged. Not far enough, I guess, he said. Fowler nodded. Right, he said. Not far enough. If she's not standing right here in thirty minutes, we'll come looking for you. We'll give it a two-mile radius. Reacher thought about it and nodded. A half hour with a hundred and twenty pounds on his back might get him more than two miles. Two miles was probably pessimistic. But he thought back to the map on Borkin's wall. Thought about the savage terrain. Where the hell would he run? He made a show of checking his watch. Fowler walked away, up behind the ruined office building. The guards slung their weapons over their shoulders and stood easy. Holly smoothed her hair back. Stood face up to the pale sun. Can you walk for a while? Reacher asked her. Slowly, she said. She set off north along the middle of the deserted street. Reacher strolled beside her. They waited until they were out of sight. They glanced at each other. Then they turned and flung themselves together. Her crutch toppled to the ground and he lifted her a foot in the air. She wrapped her arms around him and buried her face in his neck. I'm going crazy in there, she said. I've got bad news, he said. What, she said. They had a helper in Chicago, he said. She stared up at him. They were only gone five days, he said. That's what Fowler said at the trial. He said Loder had been gone just five days. So, she said. So they didn't have time for surveillance, he said. They hadn't been watching you. Somebody told them where you were going to be, and when. They had help, Holly. The color in her face drained away. It was replaced by shock. Five days, she said. You sure? Reacher nodded. Holly went quiet. She was thinking hard. So who knew, he asked her. Who knew where you'd be, 12 o'clock Monday. A roommate, a friend. Her eyes were darting left and right. She was racing through the possibilities. Nobody knew, she said. Were you ever tailed, he asked. She shrugged helplessly. Reacher could see she desperately wanted to say yes, I was tailed. Because he knew to say no was too awful for her to contemplate. Were you, he asked again. No, she said quietly. By a bozo like one of these. Forget it, I'd have spotted them, and they'd have had to hang around all day outside the federal building, just waiting. We'd have picked him up in a heartbeat. So, he asked, my lunch break was flexible, she said. It varied, sometimes by a couple of hours either way. It was never regular. So, he asked again. She stared at him. So it was inside help, she said. Inside the bureau. Had to be. Think about it, no other possibility. Somebody in the office saw me leave and dropped a dime. He said nothing. Just watched the dismay on her face. A mole inside Chicago, she said. A statement, not a question. Inside the bureau. No other possibility. Shit, I don't believe it. Then she smiled. A brief, bitter smile. And we've got a mole inside here, she said. Ironic, right. He identified himself to me. Young guy, big scar on his forehead. He's undercover for the bureau. He says we've got people in a lot of these groups. Deep undercover, in case of emergency. He called it in when they put the dynamite in my walls. He stared back at her. You know about the dynamite, he said. She grimaced and nodded. No wonder you're going crazy in there, he said. 
Then he stared at her in a new panic. Who does this undercover guy call in to? He asked urgently. Our office in Butte, Polly said. It's just a satellite office. One resident agent. He communicates by radio. He's got a transmitter hidden out in the woods. But he's not using it now. He says they're scanning the frequencies. He shuddered. So how long before the Chicago mole blows his cover, he said. Polly went paler. Soon, I guess, she said. Soon as somebody figures we were headed out in this direction. Chicago will be dialing up the computers and trawling for any reports coming out of Montana. His stuff will be top of the damn pile. Christ, Reacher, you've got to get to him first. You've got to warn him. His name is Jackson. They turned back, started hurrying south through the ghost town. He says he can break me out, Polly said. Tonight, by Jeep, Reacher nodded grimly. Go with him, he said. Not without you, she said. They're sending me anyway, he said. I'm supposed to be an emissary. I'm supposed to tell your people it's hopeless. Are you going to go, she asked. He shook his head. Not if I can help it, he said. Not without you, you should go, she said. Don't worry about me, he shook his head again. I'm worrying about you, he said. Just go, she said. Forget me and get out. He shrugged, said nothing. Get out if you get the chance, Reacher, she said. I mean it. She looked like she meant it. She was glaring at him. Only if you're gone first, he said finally. I'm sticking around until you're out of here. I'm definitely not leaving you with these maniacs. But you can't stick around, she said. If I'm gone, they'll go apes hit. It'll change everything. He looked at her. Heard Bork and say, she's more than his daughter. Why, Holly, he said. Why will it change everything? Who the hell are you? She didn't answer. Glanced away. Fowler strolled into view, coming north, smoking. He walked up to them. Stopped right in front of them. Pulled his pack. Cigarette, he asked. Holly looked at the ground. Reacher shook his head. She tell you, Fowler asked. All the comforts of home. The guards were standing to attention. They were in a sort of honor guard on the courthouse steps. Fowler walked Holly. To them, a guard took her inside. At the door, she glanced back at Reacher. He nodded to her, tried to make it say, see you later, okay. Then she was gone. Now for the grand tour, Fowler said. You stick close to me. Bo's orders. But you can ask any questions you want, okay. Reacher glanced vaguely at him and nodded. Glanced at the six guards behind him. He walked down the steps and paused. Looked over at the flagpole. It was set dead center in the remains of a fine square of lawn in front of the building. He walked across to it and stood in Loder's blood and looked around. The town of York was pretty much dead. Looked like it had died some time ago. And it looked like it had never been much of a place to begin with. The road came through north to south, and there had been four developed blocks flanking it, two on the east side and two on the west. The courthouse took up the whole of the southeastern block and it faced what might have been some kind of a county office on the southwestern block. The western side of the street was higher. The ground sloped way up. The foundation of the county office building was about level with the second floor of the courthouse. It had started out the same type of structure, but it had fallen into ruin, maybe 30 years before. The paint was peeled and the siding showed through iron gray. There was no glass in any window. The sloping knoll surrounding it had returned to mountain scrub. There had been an ornamental tree dead center. It had died a long time ago, and it was now just a stump, maybe seven feet high, like an execution post. The northern blocks were rows of faded, boarded up stores. There had once been tall ornate frontages concealing simple square buildings, but the decay of the years had left the frontages the same dull brown as the boxy wooden structures behind. The signs above the doors had faded to nothing. There were no people on the sidewalks. No vehicle noise, no activity, no nothing. The place was a ghost. It looked like an abandoned cowboy town from the old west. This was a mining town, Fowler said. Lead, mostly, but some copper, and a couple of seams of good silver for a while. There was a lot of money made here, that's for damn sure. So what happened? Reacher asked. Fowler shrugged. What happens to any mining place? He said, it gets worked out, is what? Fifty years ago, people were registering claims in that old county office like there was no tomorrow, and they were disputing them in that old courthouse. 
and there were saloons and banks and stores up and down the street. Then they started coming up with dirt instead of metal, and they move on, and this is what got left behind. Fowler was looking around at the dismal view and Reacher was following his gaze. Then he transferred his eyes upward a couple of degrees and took in the giant mountains rearing on the horizon. They were massive and indifferent, still streaked with snow on the 3rd of July. Mist hung in the passes and floated through the dense conifers. Fowler moved and Reacher followed him up a track launching steeply northwest behind the ruined county office. The guards followed in single file behind. He realized this was the track he'd stumbled along twice in the dark the night before. After a hundred yards, they were in the trees. The track wound uphill through the forest. Progress was easier in the filtered green daylight. After a mile of walking they had made maybe a half mile of straight line progress and they came out in the clearing the white truck had driven into the previous night. There was a small sentry squad, armed and immaculate, standing at attention in the center of the space. But there was no sign of the white truck. It had been driven away. We call this the bastion, Fowler said. These were the very first acres we bought. In the clear daylight, the place looked different. The bastion was a big tidy clearing in the brush, nestled in a mountain bowl 300 feet above the town itself. There was no man-made perimeter. The perimeter had been supplied a million years ago by the great glaciers grinding down from the pole. The north and west sides were mountainous, rearing straight up to the high peaks. Reacher saw snow again, packed by the wind into the high north-facing gullies. If it was there in July, it had to be there twelve months of the year. To the southeast, the town was just visible below them through the gaps in the trees where the track had been carved out. Reacher could see the ruined county building and the white courthouse set below it like models. Directly south, the mountain slopes fell away into the thick forest. Where there were no trees, there were savage ravines. Reacher gazed at him, quietly. Fowler pointed. Hundred feet deep, some of those, he said. Full of elk and bighorn sheep. And we got black bears roaming. A few of the folk have seen mountain lions on the prowl. You can hear them in the night, when it gets real quiet. Reacher nodded and listened to the stunning silence tried to figure out how much quieter the nights could be. Fowler turned and pointed here and there. This is what we built, he said. So far. Reacher nodded again. The clearing held ten buildings. They were all large utilitarian wooden structures, built from plywood sheet and cedar, resting on solid concrete piles. There was an electricity supply into each building from a loop of heavy cable running between them. Power comes up from the town, Fowler said. A mile of cable, running water, too, piped down from a pure mountain lake through plastic tubing, installed by militia labor. Reacher saw the hut he'd been locked into most of the night. It was smaller than the others. Administration hut, Fowler said. One of the huts had a whip antenna on the roof, maybe 60 feet high. Shortwave radio, and Reacher could see a thinner cable, strapped to the heavy power line. It snaked into the same hut, and didn't come out again. You guys are on the phone, he asked. Unlisted, right, he pointed and Fowler followed his gaze. The phone line, he said, runs up from York with the power cable. But there's no telephone. World government would tap our calls. He gestured for Reacher to follow him over to the hut with the antenna, where the line terminated. They pushed in together through the narrow door. Fowler spread his hands in a proud little gesture. The communications hut, he said. The hut was dark and maybe 20 feet by 12. Two men inside, one crouched over a tape recorder, listening to something on headphones, the other slowly turning the dial of a radio scanner. Both long sides of the hut had crude wooden desks built into the walls. Reacher glanced up at the gable and saw the telephone wire running in through a hole drilled in the wall. It coiled down and fed a modem. The modem was wired into a pair of glowing desktop computers. The National Militia Internet, Fowler said. A second wire bypassed the desktops and fed a fax machine. It was whirring a waiter itself and slowly rolling a curl of paper out. The Patriotic Fax Network, Fowler said. Reacher nodded and walked closer. The fax machine sat on the counter next to another computer and a large shortwave radio. This is the shadow media, Fowler said. 
We depend on all this equipment for the truth about what's going on in America. You can't get the truth any other way. Reacher took a last look around and shrugged. I'm hungry, he said. That's the truth about me. No dinner and no breakfast. You got some place with coffee. Fowler looked at him and grinned. Sure, he said. Mess hall serves all day. What do you think we are? A bunch of savages. He dismissed the six guards and gestured again for Reacher to follow him. The mess hall was next to the communications hut. It was about four times the size, twice as long and twice as wide. Outside, it had a sturdy chimney on the roof, fabricated from bright galvanized metal. Inside, it was full of rough trestle tables in neat lines, simple benches pushed carefully underneath. It smelled of old food and the dusty smell that large communal spaces always have. There were three women working in there. They were cleaning the tables. They were dressed in olive fatigues, and they all had long, clean hair and plain, unadorned faces, red hands and no jewelry. They paused when Fowler and Reacher walked in. They stopped working and stood together, watching. Reacher recognized one of them from the courtroom. She gave him a cautious nod of greeting. Fowler stepped forward. Our guest missed breakfast, he said. The cautious woman nodded again. Sure, she said. What can I get you? Anything, Reacher said, as long as it's got coffee with it. Five minutes, the woman said. She led the other two away through a door where the kitchen was bumped out in back. Fowler sat down at a table and Reacher took the bench opposite. Three times a day, this place gets used for meals, Fowler said. The rest of the time, afternoons and evenings mainly, it gets used as the central meeting place for the community. Bo gets up on the table and tells the folk what needs doing. Where is Bo right now? Reacher asked. You'll see him before you go, Fowler said. Count on it. Reacher nodded slowly and focused through the small window toward the mountains. The new angle gave him a glimpse of a farther range, maybe 50 miles distant, hanging there in the clear air between the earth and the sky. The silence was still awesome. Where is everybody? He asked. Working, Fowler said. Working, and training. Working, Reacher said. Working at what? Building up the southern perimeter, Fowler said. The ravines are shallow in a couple of places. Tanks could get through. You know what an abatis is. Reacher looked blank. He knew what an abatis was. Any conscientious West Pointer who could read knew what an abatis was. But he wasn't about to let Fowler know exactly how much he knew about anything. So he just looked blank. You fell some trees, Fowler said. Every fifth or sixth tree, you chop it down. You drop it facing away from the enemy. The trees around here, they're mostly wild pines, the branches face upward, right. So when they're felled, the branches are facing away from the enemy. Tank runs into the chopped end of the tree, tries to push it along. But the branches snag against the trees you left standing. Pretty soon, that tank is trying to push two or three trees over. Then four or five, can't be done. Even a big tank like an Abrams can't do it. 1500 horsepower gas turbine on it, 63 tons, it's going to stall when it's trying to push all those trees over. Even if they ship the big Russian tanks in against us, it can't be done. That's an Abati's breacher. Use the power of nature against them. They can't get through those damn trees, that's for sure. Soviets used it against Hitler, Kursk, World War II. An old commie trick, now we're turning it around against them. What about infantry? Reacher said. Tanks won't come alone. They'll have infantry right there with them. They'll just skip ahead and dynamite the trees. Fowler grinned. They'll try, he said. Then they'll stop trying. We've got machine gun positions 50 yards north of the abatises. We'll cut them to pieces. The cautious woman came back out of the kitchen carrying a tray. She put it down on the table in front of Reacher. Eggs, bacon, fried potatoes, beans, all on an enamel plate. A metal pint mug of steaming coffee. Cheap flatware. Enjoy, she said. Thank you, Reacher said. I don't get coffee, Fowler said. The cautious woman pointed to the back. Help yourself, she said. Fowler tried a man-to-man look at Reacher and got up. Reacher kept on looking blank. Fowler walked back to the kitchen and ducked in the door. The woman watched him go and laid a hand on Reach's arm. I need to talk to you, she whispered. 
Find me after lights out, tonight. I'll meet you outside the kitchen door, okay? Talk to me now, Richa whispered back. I could be gone by then. You've got to help us, the woman whispered. Then Fowler came back out into the hall and the woman's eyes clouded with terror. She straightened up and hurried away. There were six bolts through each of the long tubes in the bed frame. Two of them secured the mesh panel which held up the mattress. Then there were two at each end, fixing the long tube to the right angle flanges attached to the legs. She had studied the construction for a long time, and she had spotted an improvement. She could leave one flange bolted to one end. It would stand out like a rigid right-angled hook. Better than separating the flange and then jamming it into the open end. More strength. But it still left her with six bolts. She would have to take the flange off the leg. An improvement, but not a shortcut. She worked fast. No reason to believe Jackson would fail, but his odds had just worsened. Worsened dramatically. Next to the mess hall were the dormitories. There were four large buildings, all of them immaculate and deserted. Two of them were designated as barracks for single men and single women. The other two were subdivided by plywood partitions. Families lived there, the adults in pairs in small cubicles behind the partitions, the children in an open dormitory area. Their beds were three-quarter size iron cots, lined up in neat rows. There were half-size foot lockers at the ends of the cots. No drawings on the walls, no toys. The only decor was a tourist poster from Washington, D.C. It was an aerial photograph taken from the north on a sunny spring day, with the White House in the right foreground. The mall in the middle and the Capitol end on to the left. It was framed in plastic and the tourist message had been covered over with paper and a new title had been hand-lettered in its place. The new title read, This is your enemy. Where are all the kids right now? Reacher asked. In school, Fowler said. Winter, they use the mess hall. Summer, they're out in the woods. What do they learn? Reacher asked. Fowler shrugged. Stuff they need to know, he said. Who decides what they need to know? Reacher asked. Bo, Fowler said. He decides everything. So what has he decided they need to know? Reacher asked. He studied it pretty carefully, Fowler said comes down to the Bible, the Constitution, history, physical training, woodsmanship, hunting, weapons. Who teaches them all that stuff? Reacher asked. The women? Fowler replied. The kids happy here? Reacher asked. Fowler shrugged again. They're not here to be happy, he said. They're here to survive. The next hut was empty, apart from another computer terminal, standing alone on a desk in a corner. Reacher could see a big keyboard lock fastened to it. I guess this is our treasury department, Fowler said. All our funds are in the Caymans. We need some, we use that computer to send it anywhere we want. How much you got? Reacher asked. Fowler smiled, like a conspirator. Shitloads, he said. Twenty million in bearer bonds. Less what we've spent already. But we got plenty left. Don't you worry about us getting short. Stolen, Reacher asked. Fowler shook his head and grinned captured, he said, from the enemy. Twenty million. The final two buildings were storehouses. One stood in line with the last dormitory. The other was set some distance away. Fowler led Reacher into the nearer shed. It was crammed with supplies. One wall was lined with huge plastic drums filled with water. Beans, bullets and bandages, Fowler said. That's Bo's motto. Sooner or later we're going to face a siege. That's for damn sure. And it's pretty obvious the first thing the government is going to do, right? They're going to fire artillery shells armed with plague germs into the lake that feeds our water system. So we've stockpiled drinking water. 24,000 gallons. That was the first priority. Then we got canned food, enough for two years. Not enough if we get a lot of people coming in to join us, but it's a good start. The storage shed was crammed. One floor to ceiling bay was packed with clothing. Familiar olive fatigues, camouflage jackets, boots. All washed and pressed in some army laundry, packed up and sold off by the bale. You want some? Fowler asked. Reacher was about to move on, but then he glanced down at what he was wearing. He had been wearing it continuously since Monday morning. Three days solid. It hadn't been the best gear to start with, and it hadn't improved with age. Okay, he said. 
The biggest sizes were at the bottom of the pile. Fowler heaved and shoved and dragged out a pair of pants, a shirt, a jacket. Reacher ignored the shiny boots. He liked his own shoes better. He stripped and dressed, hopping from foot to foot on the bare wooden floor. He did up the shirt buttons and shrugged into the jacket. The fit felt good enough. He didn't look for a mirror. He knew what he looked like in fatigues. He'd spent enough years wearing them. Next to the door, there were medical supplies ranged on shelves. Trauma kits, plasma, antibiotics, bandages. All efficiently laid out for easy access. Neat piles, with plenty of space between. Borkin had clearly rehearsed his people in rushing around and grabbing equipment and administering emergency treatment. Beans and bandages, Reacher said. What about the bullets? Fowler nodded toward the distant shed. That's the armory, he said. I'll show you. The armory was bigger than the other storage shed. Huge lock on the door. It held more weaponry than Reacher could remember seeing in a long time. Hundreds of rifles and machine guns in neat rows. The stink of fresh gun oil everywhere. Floor to ceiling stacks of ammo boxes. Familiar wooden crates of grenades. Shelves full of handguns. Nothing heavier than an infantryman could carry, but it was still a hell of an impressive sight. The two bolts securing the mesh base were the easiest. They were smaller than the others. The big bolts holding the frame together took all the strain. The mesh base just rested in there. The bolts holding it down were not structural. They could have been left out altogether, and the bed would have worked just the same. She flaked and scraped the paint back to the bare metal. Heated the bolt heads with the towel. Then she pulled the rubber tip off her crutch and bent the end of the aluminum tube into an oval. She used the strength in her fingers to crush the oval tight over the head of the bolt. Used the handle to turn the hole of the crutch like a giant socket wrench. It slipped off the bolt. She cursed quietly and used one hand to crush it tighter. Turned her hand and the crutch together as a unit. The bolt moved. There was a beaten earth path leading out north from the ring of wooden buildings. Fowler walked Reacher down it. It led to a shooting range. The range was a long, flat alley painstakingly cleared of trees and brush. It was silent and unoccupied. It was only 20 yards wide, but over a half mile long. There was matting laid at one end for the shooters to lie on, and far in the distance Reacher could see the targets. He set off on a slow stroll toward them. They looked like standard military issue plywood cutouts of running, crouching soldiers. The design dated right back to World War II. The crude screen printing depicted a German infantryman, with a coal scuttle helmet and a savage snarl. But as he got closer Reacher could see these particular targets had crude painted editions of their own. They had new badges daubed on the chests in yellow paint. Each new badge had three letters. Four targets had FBI. Four had ATF. The targets were staggered backward over distances ranging from 300 yards right back to the full 800. The nearer targets were peppered with bullet holes. Everybody has to hit the 300-yard targets, Fowler said. It's a requirement of citizenship here. Reacher shrugged. Wasn't impressed. 300 yards was no kind of a big deal. He kept on strolling down the half-mile. The 400-yard targets were damaged, the 500-yard boards less so. Reacher counted 18 hits at 600 yards, 7 at 700, and just 2 at the full 800. How old are these boards? he asked. Fowler shrugged. A month, he said. Maybe two. We're working on it. You better, Reacher said. We don't figure to be shooting at a distance, Fowler replied. Bo's guess is the UN forces will come at night. When they think we're resting up. He figures they might succeed in penetrating our perimeter to some degree. Maybe by a half mile or so. I don't think they will, but Bo's a cautious guy. And he's the one with all the responsibility. So our tactics are going to be nighttime outflanking maneuvers. Encircle the UN penetration in the forest and mow it down with crossfire. Up close and personal, right. That training's going pretty well. We can move fast and quiet in the dark, no lights, no sound, no problem at all. Reacher looked at the forest and thought about the wall of ammunition he'd seen. Thought about Borkin's boast, impregnable. Thought about the problems an army faces fighting committed guerrillas in difficult terrain. 
nothing is ever really impregnable, but the casualties in taking this place were going to be spectacular. This morning, Fowler said. I hope you weren't upset. Reacher just looked at him. About Loder, I mean, Fowler said. Reacher shrugged. Thought to himself, it saved me a job of work. We need tough discipline, Fowler said. All new nations go through a phase like this. Harsh rules, tough discipline. Bose made a study of it. Right now, it's very important. But it can be upsetting, I guess. It's you should be upset, Reacher said. You heard of Joseph Stalin? Fowler nodded. Soviet dictator, he said. Right, Reacher said. He used to do that. Do what? Fowler asked. Eliminate his potential rivals, Reacher said on trumped-up charges. Fowler shook his head. The charges were fair, he said. Loder made mistakes. Reacher shrugged. Not really, he said. He did a reasonable job. Fowler looked away. You'll be next, Reacher said. You should watch your back. Sooner or later, you'll find you've made some kind of a mistake. We go back a long way, Fowler said. Bo and me. So did Bo and Loder, right? Reacher said, Stevie will be okay. He's no threat. Too dumb. But you should think about it. You'll be next. Fowler made no reply. Just looked away again. They walked together back down the grassy half mile. Took another beaten track north. They stepped off the path to allow a long column of children to file past. They were marching in pairs, boys and girls together, with a woman in fatigues at the head of the line and another at the tail. The children were dressed in cut-down military surplus gear and they were carrying tall staffs in their right hands. Their faces were blank and acquiescent. The girls had untrimmed straight hair, and the boys had rough haircuts done with bowls and blunt shears. Reachers stood and watched them pass. They stared straight ahead as they walked. None of them risked a sideways glance at him. The new path ran uphill through a thin belt of trees and came out on a flat area 50 yards long and 50 yards wide. It had been leveled by hand. Discarded fieldston had been painted white and laid at intervals around the edge. It was quiet and deserted. Our parade ground, Fowler said, sourly. Reacher nodded and scanned around. To the north and west, the high mountains. To the east, thick virgin forest. South, he could see over the distant town, across belts of trees, to the fractured ravines beyond. A cold wind lifted his new jacket and grabbed at his shirt, and he shivered. The bigger bolts were much harder. Much more contact area, metal to metal. Much more pain to scrape. Much more force required to turn them. The more force she used, the more the crushed end of the crutch was liable to slip off. She took off her shoe and used it to hammer the end into shape. She bent and folded the soft aluminum around the head of the bolt. Then she clamped it tight with her fingers. Clamped until the slim tendons in her arms stood out like ropes and sweat ran down her face. Then she turned the crutch, holding her breath, waiting to see which would give first, the grip of her fingers or the grip of the bolt. The wind grabbing at Reach's shirt also carried some faint sounds to him. He glanced at Fowler and turned to face the western edge of the parade ground. He could hear men moving in the trees. A line of men, bursting out of the forest. They crashed out of the trees, six men line abreast, automatic rifles at the slope. Camouflage fatigues, beards. The same six guards who had stood in front of the judge's bench that morning. Dawkins' personal detail. Reacher scanned across the line of faces. The younger guy with the scar was at the left-hand end of the line. Jackson, the FBI plant. They paused and reset their course. Rushed across the leveled ground toward Reacher. As they approached, Fowler stood back, leaving Reacher looking like an isolated target. Five of the men fanned out into a loose arc. Five rifles aimed at Reacher's chest. The sixth man stepped up in front of Fowler. No salute, but there was a deference in his stance which was more or less the same thing. Bo wants this guy back, the soldier said. Something real urgent. Fowler nodded. Take him, he said. He's beginning to piss me off. The rifle muzzles jerked Reacher into a rough formation and the six men hustled him south through the thin belt of trees, moving fast. They passed through the shooting range and followed the beaten earth path back to the bastion. They turned west and walked past the armory and on into the forest toward the command hut.
Reacher lengthened his stride and sped up. Pulled ahead, let his foot hit a root and went down heavily on the stones. First guy to reach him was Jackson. Reacher saw the scarred forehead. He grabbed Reacher's arm. Mole in Chicago, Reacher breathed. On your feet, asshole, Jackson shouted back. Hide out and run for it tonight, Reacher whispered. Maximum care, okay. Jackson glanced at him and replied with a squeeze of his arm. Then he pulled him up and shoved him ahead down the path into the smaller clearing. Boborkan was framed in his command hut doorway. He was dressed in huge baggy camouflage fatigues, dirty and disheveled. Like he had been working hard. He stared at Reacher as he approached. I see we gave you new clothes, he said. Reacher nodded. So let me apologize for my own appearance, Borkin said. Busy day, Fowler told me, Reacher said. You've been building abatizes. Abatizes, Borkin said. Right. Then he went quiet. Reacher saw his big white hands, opening and closing. Your mission is cancelled, Borkin said quietly. It is, Reacher said. Why? Borkin eased his bulk down out of the doorway and stepped close. Reacher's gaze was fixed on his blazing eyes and he never saw the blow coming. Borkin hit him in the stomach, a big hard fist on the end of 400 pounds of body weight. Reacher went down like a tree and Borkin smashed a foot into his back. His name is Jackson, Webster said. How long has he been in there? Milosevic asked. Nearly a year, Webster said. 11 o'clock in the morning, Thursday, July 3rd, inside Peterson. The section head at Quantico was faxing material over from Andrews down the Air Force's own secure fax network as fast as the machines could handle it. Milosevic and Brogan were pulling it off the machines and passing it to Webster and McGrath for analysis. On the other side of the table, General Johnson and his aide were scanning a map of the northwest corner of Montana. You got people undercover in all these groups? Johnson asked. Webster shook his head and smiled. Not all of them, he said. Too many groups, not enough people. I think we just got lucky. I didn't know we had people in this one, Brogan said. Webster was still smiling. Lots of things lots of people don't know, he said. Safer that way, right? So what is this Jackson guy saying? Brogan asked. Does he mention Holly? Johnson asked. Does he mention what the hell this is all about? Milosevic asked. Webster blew out his cheeks and waved his hand at the stack of curling fax paper. McGraw was busy sifting through it. He was separating the papers into two piles. One pile for routine stuff, the other pile for important intelligence. The routine pile was bigger. The important intelligence was sketchy. Analysis, Mac. Webster said. McGraw shrugged. Up to a point, pretty much normal, he said. Johnson stared at him. Normal, he said. Webster nodded. This is normal, he said. We got these militia groups all over the country, which is why we can't cover them all. Too damn many. Our last count was way over 400 groups, all 50 states. Most of them are just amateur wackos, but some of them we consider pretty serious anti-government terrorists. This bunch? Johnson asked. McGraw looked at him. This bunch is totally serious, he said. One hundred people, hidden out in the forest. Very well armed, very well organized, very self-contained. Very well funded, too. Jackson has reported mail fraud, phony bank drafts, a little low-grade counterfeiting. Probably armed robbery as well. The feeling is they stole 20 million bucks in bearer bonds, armored car heist up in the north of California. And, of course, they're selling videos and books and manuals to the rest of the wackos, mail order. Big boom industry right now. And naturally they decline to pay income tax or license their vehicles or anything else that might cost them anything. Effectively, they control York County, Webster said. How is that possible? Johnson asked because nobody else does, Webster said. You ever been up there? I haven't. Jackson says the whole place is abandoned. Everything pulled out, a long time ago. He says there's just a couple dozen citizens still around, spread out over miles of empty territory, bankrupt ranches, leftover miners, old folk. No effective county government. Borkin just eased his way in and took it over. He's calling it an experiment, McGrath said. A prototype for a brand new nation. Johnson nodded, blankly. But what about Holly? He said. 
Webster stacked the paper and laid his hand on it. He doesn't mention her, he said. His last call was Monday, the day she was grabbed up. They were building a prison. We have to assume it was for her. This guy calls in, Brogan said, by radio. Webster nodded. He's got a transmitter concealed in the forest, he said. He wanders off when he can, calls in. That's why it's all so erratic. He's been averaging one call a week. He's pretty inexperienced and he's been told to be cautious. We assume he's under surveillance. Brave new world up there, that's for damn sure. Can we call him? Milosevic asked. You're kidding, Webster said. We just sit and wait. Who does he report to? Brogan asked. Resident agent at Butte, Webster said. So what do we do? Johnson asked. Webster shrugged. The room went quiet. Right now, nothing, he said. We need a position. The room stayed quiet and Webster just looked hard at Johnson. It was a look between one government man and another and it said, you know how it is. Johnson stared back for a long time, expressionless. Then his head moved through a fractional nod. Just enough to say, for the moment, I know how it is. Johnson's aide coughed into the silence. We've got missiles north of York, he said. They're moving south right now, on their way back here. Twenty grunts, a hundred stingers, five trucks. They'll be heading straight through York, any time now. Can we use them? Brogan shook his head. Against the law, he said. Military can't participate in law enforcement. Webster ignored him and glanced at Johnson and waited. They were his men, and Holly was his daughter. The answer was better coming straight from him. There was a silence, and then Johnson shook his head. No, he said, we need time to plan. The aide spread his hands wide. We can plan, he said. We've got radio contact, ground to ground. We should go for it, general. Against the law, Brogan said again. Johnson made no reply. He was thinking hard. McGrath riffled through the pile of papers and pulled the sheet about the dynamite, packing Holly's prison walls. He held it face down on the shiny table. But Johnson shook his head again. No, he said again. Twenty men against a hundred. They're not frontline troops. They're not infantry. And their stingers won't help us. I assume these terrorists don't have an air force, right? No, we wait. Bring the missile unit right back here, fastest. No engagement. The aide shrugged and McGrath slipped the dynamite report back into the pile. Webster looked around and slapped both palms lightly on the tabletop. I'm going back to DC, he said. Got to get a position. Johnson shrugged his shoulders. He knew nothing could start without a trip back to D.C. to get a position. Webster turned to McGrath. You three move up to Butte, he said. Get settled in the office there. If this guy Jackson calls, put him on maximum alert. We can chopper you up there, the aide said. And we need surveillance, Webster said. Can you get the Air Force to put some camera planes over York? Johnson nodded. They'll be there, he said. 24 hours a day. We'll give you a live video feed into Butte. A rat farts, you'll see it. No intervention, Webster said. Not yet. She heard footsteps in the corridor at the exact moment the sixth bolt came free. A light tread. Not Jackson. Not a man treading carefully. A woman, walking normally. The steps halted outside her door. There was a pause. She rested the long tube back on the frame. A key went into the lock. She pulled the mattress back into place. Dragged the blanket over it. Another pause. The door opened. A woman came into the room. She looked like all of them looked. White, lean, long straight hair, strong plain face, no makeup, no adornment, red hands. She was carrying a tray, with a white cloth mounded up over it. No weapon. Lunch, she said. Holly nodded. Her heart was pounding. The woman was standing there, the tray in her hands, looking around the room, staring hard at the new pine walls. Where do you want this? She asked. On the bed. Holly shook her head. On the floor, she said. The woman bent and placed the tray on the floor. Guess you could use a table, she said. And a chair. Holly glanced down at the flatware and thought tools. You want me to get him to bring you a chair? The woman asked. No, Holly said. Well, I could use one, the woman said. I've got to wait and watch you eat. Make sure you don't steal the silverware. Holly nodded vaguely and circled around the woman. Glanced at the open door. The woman followed her gaze and grinned. Nowhere to run, she said. 
we're a long way from anywhere, and there's some difficult terrain in the way. North, you'd reach Canada in a couple of weeks, if you found enough roots and berries and bugs to eat. West, you'd have to swim the river. East, you'd get lost in the forest or eaten by a bear, and even if you didn't, you're still a month away from Montana. South, we'd shoot you. The border is crawling with guards. You wouldn't stand a chance. The road is blocked, Polly asked. The woman smiled. We blew the bridge, she said. There is no road, not anymore. When, Polly asked her, we drove in. Just now, the woman said. You didn't hear it, I guess you wouldn't, not with these walls. So how does Reacher get sent out? Polly asked. He's supposed to be carrying some sort of a message. The woman smiled again. That plan has changed, she said. Mission cancelled. He's not going. Why not? Polly asked. The woman looked straight at her. We found out what happened to Peter Bell, she said. Polly went quiet. Reacher killed him, the woman said. Suffocated him. In North Dakota, we were just informed, but I expect you know all about it, right? Polly stared at her. She thought, Reacher's in big trouble. She saw him, handcuffed and alone somewhere. How did you find out? She asked quietly. The woman shrugged. We have a lot of friends, she said. Polly kept on staring at her. She thought, the mole. They know we were in North Dakota. Takes a map and a ruler to figure out where we are now. She saw computer keyboards clicking and Jackson's name scrolling up on a dozen screens. What's going to happen to Reacher? She asked. A life for a life, the woman said. That's the rule here. Same for your friend Reacher as for anybody else. But what's going to happen to him? Polly asked again. The woman laughed. Doesn't take much imagination, she said. Or maybe it does. I don't expect it's going to be anything real simple. Polly shook her head. It was self-defense, she said. The guy was trying to rape me. The woman looked at her, scornfully. So how is that self-defense? She said, wasn't trying to rape Reacher, was he? And you were probably asking for it, anyhow. What? Polly said, shaking your tail at him. The woman said, we know all about smart little city bitches like you. Poor old Peter never stood a chance. Polly just stared at her. Then she glanced at the door. Where is Reacher now? She asked. No idea, the woman said. Chained to a tree somewhere, I guess. Then she grinned. But I know where he's going, she said. The parade ground. That's where they usually do that sort of stuff. We're all ordered up there to watch the fun. Polly stared at her. Then she swallowed. Then she nodded. Will you help me with this bed? She asked. Something wrong with it? The woman paused. Then she followed her over. What's wrong with it? She asked. Polly pulled the blanket back and heaved the mattress onto the floor. The bolts seem a little loose, she said. Where? The woman said. Here, Polly said. She used both hands on the long tube, whipped it upward and spun and smashed it like a blunt spear into the side of the woman's head. The flange hit her like a metal fist. Skin tore and a neat rectangle of bone punched deep into her brain and she bounced off the mattress and was dead before she hit the floor. Polly stepped carefully over the tray of lunch and limped calmly toward the open door. Harland Webster got back to the Hoover building from Colorado at 3 o'clock Thursday afternoon, East Coast time. He went straight to his office suite and checked his messages. Then he buzzed his secretary. Car, he said. He went down in his private elevator to the garage and met his driver. They walked over to the limousine and got in. White House, Webster said. You seeing the president, sir? The driver asked, surprised. Webster sculled forward at the back of the guy's head. He wasn't seeing the president. He didn't see the president very often. He didn't need reminding of that, especially not by a damn driver sounding all surprised that there even was such a possibility. Attorney General, he said. White House is where she is right now. His driver nodded silently, cursed himself for opening his big mouth, drove on smoothly and unobtrusively. The distance between the Hoover building and the White House was exactly 1,600 yards. Less than a mile. Not even far enough to click over the little number in the speedometer on the limousine's dash. It would have been quicker to walk. And cheaper. Firing up the cold V8 and hauling all that bulletproof plating 1,600 yards really ate up the gas. But the director couldn't walk anywhere. Theory was he'd get assassinated. 
Fact was, there were probably about eight people in the city who would recognize him. Just another DC guy in a gray suit and a quiet tie. Anonymous. Another reason old Webster was never in the best of tempers, his driver thought. Webster knew the attorney general pretty well. She was his boss, but his familiarity with her did not come from their face-to-face meetings. It came instead from the background checks the bureau had run prior to her confirmation. Webster probably knew more about her than anybody else on earth did. Her parents and friends and ex-colleagues all knew their own separate perspectives. Webster had put all of those together and he knew the whole picture. Her bureau file took up as much disk space as a short novel. Nothing at all in the file made him dislike her. She had been a lawyer, faintly radical at the start of her career, built up a decent practice, grabbed a judgeship, never annoyed the law enforcement community. Without ever becoming a rabbit foaming at the mouth pain in the ass. An ideal appointment, sailed through her confirmation with no problem at all. Since then, she had proven to be a good boss and a great ally. Her name was Ruth Rosen and the only problem Webster had with her was that she was 12 years younger than him, very good looking, and a whole lot more famous than he was. His appointment was for four o'clock. He found Rosen alone in a small room, two floors and eight secret service agents away from the Oval Office. She greeted him with a strained smile and an urgent inclination of her elegant head. Polly, she asked. He nodded. He gave her the spread, top to bottom. She listened hard and ended up pale, with her lips clamped tight. We totally sure this is where she is, she asked. He nodded again. Sure as we can be, he said. Okay, she said. Wait there, will you? She left the small room. Webster waited. Ten minutes, then twenty, then a half hour. He paced. He gazed out of the window. He opened the door and glanced out into the corridor. A secret serviceman glanced back at him. Took a pace forward. Webster shook his head in answer to the question the guy hadn't asked and closed the door again. Just sat down and waited. Ruth Frozen was gone an hour. She came back in and closed the door. Then she just stood there, a yard inside the small room, pale, breathing hard, some kind of shock on her face. She said nothing. Just let it dawn on him that there was some kind of a big problem happening. What? he asked. I'm out of the loop on this, she said. What? he asked again. They took me out of the loop, she said. My reactions were wrong. Dexter is handling it from here. Dexter, he repeated. Dexter was the president's White House chief of staff. A political fixer from the old school. As hard as a nail, and half as sentimental. But he was the main reason the president was sitting there in the Oval Office with a big majority of the popular vote. I'm very sorry, Harland, Ruth Rosen said. He'll be here in a minute. He nodded sourly and she went back out the door and left him to wait again. The relationship between the rest of the FBI and the field office in Butte, Montana, is similar to the relationship between Moscow and Siberia, proverbially speaking. It's a standard bureau joke. Screw up, the joke goes, and you'll be working out of Butte tomorrow. Like some kind of an internal exile. Like KGB foul ups were supposedly sent out to write parking tickets in Siberia. But on that Thursday, July 3rd, the field office in Butte felt like the center of the universe for McGrath and Milosevic and Brogan. It felt like the most desirable posting in the world. None of the three had ever been there before. Not on business, not on vacation. None of them would have ever considered going there. But now they were peering out of the Air Force helicopter like kids on their way to the Magic Kingdom. They were looking at the landscape below and swiveling the gaze northwest toward where they knew York County was hiding under the distant hazy mist. The resident agent at Butte was a competent bureau veteran still reeling after a personal call from Harland Webster direct from the Hoover building. His instructions were to drive the three Chicago agents to his office, brief them on the way, get them installed, rent them a couple of jeeps. And then get the hell out and stay the hell out until further notice. So he was waiting at the Silver Bow County Airport when the dirty black Air Force chopper clattered in. He piled the agents into his government Buick and blasted back north to town. Distances are big around here, he said to McGrath. 
don't ever forget that, we're still 240 miles shy of York. On our roads, that's four hours, absolute minimum. Me, I'd get some mobile units and move up a lot closer. Basing yourselves down here won't help you much, not if things start to turn bad up there. McGrath nodded. You hear from Jackson again, he asked. Not since Monday, the resident agent said. The dynamite thing. Next time he calls, he speaks to me, okay. McGrath said. The butte guy nodded, fished one-handed in his pocket while he drove, pulled out a small radio receiver. McGrath took it from him, put it into his own pocket. Be my guest, the butte guy said. I'm on vacation, Webster's orders, but don't hold your breath. Jackson doesn't call often, he's very cautious. The field office was just a single room, second floor of a two-floor municipal building. A desk, two chairs, a computer, a big map of Montana on the wall, a lot of filing space, and a ringing telephone. McGrath answered it. He listened and grunted. Hung up and waited for the resident agent to take the hint. Okay, I'm gone, the old guy said. Silver Bow Jeep will bring you a couple of vehicles over. Anything else you guys need? Privacy, Brogan said. The old guy nodded and glanced around his office. Then he was gone. Air Force has put a couple of spy planes up there, McGrath said. Satellite gear is coming in by road. The general and his aide are coming here. Looks like they're going to be our guests for the duration. Can't really argue with that, right? Milosevic was studying the map on the wall. Wouldn't want to argue with that, he said. We're going to need some favors. You guys ever seen a worse looking place? McGrath and Brogan joined him in front of the map. Milosevic's finger was planted on York. Ferocious green and brown terrain boiled all around it. 4,000 square miles, Milosevic said. One road and one track. They chose a good spot, Brogan said. I spoke with the president, Dexter said. He sat back and paused. Webster stared at him. What the hell else would he have been doing? Pruning the rose garden. Dexter was staring back. He was a small guy, burned up, dark, twisted, the way a person gets to look after spending every minute of every day figuring every possible angle. And, Webster said, there are 66 million gun owners in this country, Dexter said. So, Webster asked, our analysts think they all share certain basic sympathies, Dexter said. What analysts? Webster said. What sympathies? There was a poll, Dexter said. Did we send you a copy? One adult in five would be willing to take up arms against the government, if strictly necessary. So, Webster asked again. There was another poll, Dexter said. A simple question, to be answered intuitively, from the gut. Who's in the right, the government or the militias? And, Webster said. Twelve million Americans sided with the militias, Dexter said. Webster stared at him, waited for the message. So, Dexter said, somewhere between 12 and 66 million voters. What about them? Webster asked. And where are they? Dexter asked back. You won't find many of them in D.C. or New York or Boston or L.A. It's a skewed sample. Some places they're a tiny minority. They look like weirdos. But other places, they're a majority. Other places, they're absolutely normal, Harland. So, he said, some places they control counties, Dexter said, even states. Webster stared at him. God's sake, Dexter, this isn't politics, he said. This is Holly. Dexter paused and glanced around the small White House room. It was painted a subtle off-white. It had been painted and repainted that same subtle color every few years, while presidents came and went. He smiled a connoisseur's smile. Unfortunately, everything's politics, he said. This is Holly, Webster said again. Dexter shook his head. Just a slight movement. This is emotion, he said. Think about innocent little emotional words, like patriot, resistance, crush, underground, struggle, oppression, individual, distrust, rebel, revolt, revolution, rights. There's a certain majesty to those words, don't you think? In an American context, Webster shook his head doggedly. Nothing majestic about kidnapping women, he said. Nothing majestic about illegal weapons, illegal armies, stolen dynamite. This isn't politics. Dexter shook his head again. The same slight movement. Things have a way of becoming politics, he said. 
Think about Ruby Ridge. Think about Waco, Harland. That wasn't politics, right? But it became politics pretty damn soon. We hurt ourselves with maybe 66 million voters there. And we were real dumb about it. Big reactions are what these people want. They figure that harsh reprisals will upset people, bring more people into their fold. And we gave them big reactions. We fueled their fire. We made it look like big government was just about itching to crush the little guy. The room went silent. The polls say we need a better approach, Dexter said, and we're trying to find one. We're trying real hard. So how would it look if the White House stopped trying just because it happens to be Holly who's involved? And right now, the 4th of July weekend. Don't you understand anything? Think about it, Harland. Think about the reaction. Think about words like vindictive, self-interested, revenge, personal, words like that, Harland. Think about what words like those are going to do to our poll numbers. Webster stared at him. The off-white walls crushed in on him. This is about Holly, for God's sake, he said. This is not about poll numbers. And what about the general? Has the president said all this to him? Dexter shook his head. I've said it all to him, he said. Personally. A dozen times. He's been calling every hour, on the hour. Webster thought, now the president won't even take Johnson's calls anymore. Dexter has really fixed him. And, he asked. Dexter shrugged. I think he understands the principle, he said. But naturally, his judgment is kind of colored right now. He's not a happy man. Webster lapsed into silence. Started thinking hard. He was a smart enough bureaucrat to know if you can't beat them, you join them. You force yourself to think like they think. But busting her out could do you good, he said. A lot of good. It would look tough, decisive, loyal, no nonsense. Could be advantageous. In the polls. Dexter nodded. I totally agree with you, he said. But it's a gamble, right? A real big gamble. A quick victory is good. A foul up is a disaster. A big gamble, with big poll numbers at stake. And. Right now, I'm doubting if you can get the quick victory. Right now, you're half cocked. So right now my money would be on the foul up. Webster stared at him. Hey, no offense, Harland, Dexter said. I'm paid to think like this, right? So what the hell are you saying here? Webster asked him. I need to move the hostage rescue team into place right now. No, Dexter said. No, Webster repeated incredulously. Dexter shook his head. Permission denied, he said. For the time being, Webster just stared at him. I need a position, he said. The room stayed silent. Then Dexter spoke to a spot on the off-white wall, a yard to the left of Webster's chair. You remain in personal command of the situation, he said. Holiday weekend starts tomorrow. Come talk to me Monday. If there's still a problem. There's a problem now, Webster said. And I'm talking to you now. Dexter shook his head again. No, you're not, he said. We didn't meet today, and I didn't speak with the president today. We didn't know anything about it today. Tell us all about it on Monday, Harland, if there's still a problem. Webster just sat there. He was a smart enough guy, but right then he couldn't figure if he was being handed the deal of a lifetime, or a suicide pill. Johnson and his aide arrived in Butte an hour later. They came in the same way, Air Force helicopter from Peterson up to the Silver Bow County Airport. Milosevic took an air-to-ground call as they were on approach and went out to meet them in a two-year-old Grand Cherokee supplied by the local dealership. Nobody spoke on the short ride back to town. Milosevic just drove and the two military men bent over charts and maps from a large leather case the aide was carrying. They passed them back and forth and nodded, as if further comment was unnecessary. The upstairs room in the municipal building was suddenly crowded. Five men, two chairs. The only window faced southeast over the street. The wrong direction. The five men were instinctively glancing at the blank wall opposite. Through that wall was Holly, 240 miles away. We're going to have to move up there, General Johnson said. His aide nodded. No good staying here, he said. McGrath had made a decision. He had promised himself he wouldn't fight turf wars with these guys. His agent was Johnson's daughter. He understood the old guy's feelings. He wasn't going to squander time and energy proving who was boss. And he needed the old guy's help. 
We need to share facilities, he said. Just for the time being. There was a short silence. The general nodded slowly. He knew enough about Washington to decode those five words with a fair degree of accuracy. I don't have many facilities available, he said in turn. It's the holiday weekend. Exactly 75% of the U.S. Army is on leave. Silence. McGrath's turn to do the decoding and the slow nodding. No authorization to cancel leave, he asked. The general shook his head. I just spoke with Dexter, he said. And Dexter just spoke with the president. Feeling was this thing is on hold until Monday. The crowded room went silent. The guy's daughter was in trouble, and the White House fixer was playing politics. Webster got the same story, McGrath said. Can't even bring the hostage rescue team up here yet. Time being, we're on our own, the three of us. The general nodded to McGrath. It was a personal gesture, individual to individual, and it said, we've leveled with each other, and we both know what humiliation that cost us, and we both know we appreciate it. But there's no harm in being prepared, the general said. Like the little guy suspects, the military is comfortable with secret maneuvers. I'm calling in a few private favors that Mr. Dexter need never know about. The silence in the room eased. McGrath looked a question at him. There's a mobile command post already on its way, the general said. He took a large chart from his aide and spread it out on the desk. We're going to rendezvous right here, he said. He had his finger on a spot northwest of the last habitation in Montana short of York. It was a wide curve on the road leading into the county, about six miles shy of the bridge over the ravine. The satellite trucks are heading straight there, he said. I figure we move in, set up the command post, and seal off the road behind us. McGrath stood still, looking down at the map. He knew that to agree was to hand over total control to the military. He knew that to disagree was to play petty games with his agent and this man's daughter. Then he saw that the general's finger was resting a half inch south of a much better location. A little farther north, the road narrowed dramatically. It straightened to give a clear view north and south. The terrain tightened. A better site for a roadblock. A better site for a command post. He was amazed that the general hadn't spotted it. Then he was flooded with gratitude. The general had spotted it. But he was leaving room for McGrath to point it out. He was leaving room for give and take. He didn't want total control. I would prefer this place, McGrath said. He tapped the northerly location with a pencil. The general pretended to study it. His aide pretended to be impressed. Good thinking, the general said. We'll revise the rendezvous. McGrath smiled. He knew damn well the trucks were already heading for that exact spot. Probably already there. The general grinned back. The ritual dance was completed. What can the spy planes show us? Brogan asked. Everything, the general's aide said. Wait until you see the pictures. The cameras on those babies are unbelievable. I don't like it, McGrath said. It's going to make them nervous. The aide shook his head. They won't even know they're there, he said. We're using two of them, flying straight lines, east to west and west to east. They're 37,000 feet up. Nobody on the ground is even going to be aware of them. That's seven miles up, Brogan said. How can they see anything from that sort of height? Good cameras, the aide said. Seven miles is nothing. They'll show you a cigarette pack lying on the sidewalk from seven miles. The whole thing is automatic. The guys up there hit a button, and the camera tracks whatever it's supposed to track. Just keeps pointing at the spot on the ground you chose, transmitting high-quality video by satellite, then you turn around and come back, and the camera swivels around and does it all again. Undetectable, McGrath asked. They look like airliners, the aide said. You look up and you see a tiny little vapor trail and you think it's TWA on the way somewhere. You don't think it's the Air Force checking whether you polished your shoes this morning, right? Seven miles, you'll see the hairs on their heads, Johnson said. What do you think we spent all those defense dollars on? Crop dusters. McGrath nodded. He felt naked. Time being, he had nothing to offer except a couple of rental jeeps, two years old, waiting at the sidewalk. We're getting a profile on this Borkin guy, he said. Shrinks at Quantico are working it up now. We found Jack Reach's old CO, Johnson said. 
He's doing desk duty in the Pentagon. He'll join us, give us the spread. McGrath nodded. Forewarned is forearmed, he said. The telephone rang. Johnson's aide picked it up. He was the nearest. When are we leaving? Brogan asked. McGrath noticed he had asked Johnson direct. Right now, I guess, Johnson said. The Air Force will fly us up there. Save six hours on the road, right? The aide hung up the phone. He looked like he'd been kicked in the gut. The missile unit, he said. We lost radio contact, north of York. Polly paused in the corridor. Smiled. The woman had left her weapon propped against the wall outside the door. That had been the delay. She had used the key, put the tray on the floor, unslung her weapon, propped it against the wall, and picked up the tray again before nudging open the door. She swapped the iron tube for the gun. Not a weapon she had used before. Not one she wanted to use now. It was a tiny submachine gun. An Ingram Mac 10. Obsolete military issue. Obsolete for a reason. Polly's class at Quantico had laughed about it. They called it the phone booth gun. It was so inaccurate you had to be in a phone booth with your guy to be sure of hitting him. A grim joke. And it fired way too quickly. A thousand rounds per minute. One touch on the trigger and the magazine was empty. But it was a better weapon than part of an old iron bed frame. She checked the magazine. It was full, 30 shells. The chamber was clean. She clicked the trigger and watched the mechanism move. The gun worked as well as it was ever going to. She smacked the magazine back into position, straightened the canvas strap and slung it tight over her shoulder, clicked the cocking handle to the fire position and closed her hand around the grip, took a firm hold on her crutch and eased to the top of the stairs. She stood still and waited listened hard. No sound. She went down the stairs, slowly, a step at a time, the Ingram out in front of her. At the bottom, she waited and listened again. No sound. She crossed the lobby and arrived at the doors. Eased him open and looked outside. The street was deserted, but it was wide. It looked like a huge city boulevard to her. To reach safety on the other side was going to take her minutes. Minutes out there in the open, exposed to the mountain slopes above. She estimated the distance, breathed hard and gripped her crutch, jabbed the Ingram forward, breathed hard again and took off at a lurching run, jamming the crutch down, leaping ahead with her good leg, swinging the gun left and right to cover both approaches. She threw herself at the mound in front of the ruined county office, scrabbled north around behind it and fought through grabbing undergrowth, entered the forest parallel to the main track, but thirty yards from it. Leaned on a tree and bent double, gasping with exertion and fear and exhilaration. This was the real thing. This was what the whole of her life had led her to. She could hear her father's war stories in her head. The jungles of Vietnam. The breathless fear of being hunted in the green undergrowth. The triumph of each safe step, of each yard gained. She saw the faces of the tough quiet men she had known on the bases as a child. The instructors at Quantico. She felt the disappointment of her posting to a safe desk in Chicago. All the training wasted, because of who she was. Now it was different. She straightened up, took a deep breath, then another. She felt her genes boiling through her. Before, they'd felt like resented intruders. Now they felt warm and whole and good. Her father's daughter, you bet your ass. Reacher was cuffed around the trunk of a hundred foot pine. He had been dragged down the narrow track to the bastion, burning with fury. One punch and one kick was more than he had yielded since his early childhood. The rage was burying the pain, and blurring his mind. A life for a life, the fat bastard had said. Reacher had twisted on the floor and the words had meant nothing to him. But they meant something now. They had come back to him as he stood there. Men and women had strolled up too him and smiled. Their smiles were the sort of smiles he had seen before, long ago. The smiles of bored children living on an isolated base somewhere, after they had been told the circus was coming to town. She thought hard. She had to guess where he was. And she had to guess where the parade ground was. She had to get herself halfway between those two unknown locations and set up an ambush. She knew the ground sloped steeply up to the clearing with the huts. She remembered being brought downhill to the courthouse. She guessed the parade ground had to be a large flat area. 
therefore it had to be farther uphill, to the northwest, where the ground leveled out in the mountain bowl. Some distance beyond the huts, she set off uphill through the trees. She tried to figure out where the main path was running. Every few yards, she stopped and peered south, turning left and right to catch a glimpse of the gaps in the forest canopy where the trees had been cleared. That way, she could deduce the direction of the track. She kept herself parallel to it, 30 or 40 yards away to the north, and fought through the tough whippy stems growing sideways from the trunks. It was all uphill, and steep, and it was hard work. She used her crutch like a boatman uses a pole, planting it securely in the soil and thrusting herself upward against it. In a way, her knee helped her. It made her climb slowly and carefully. It made her quiet, and she knew how to do this. From old Vietnam stories, not from Quantico. The academy had concentrated on urban situations. The bureau had taught her how to stalk through a city street or a darkened building. How to stalk through a forest came from an earlier layer of memory. Some people strolled up and strolled away, but some of them stayed. After a quarter hour, there was a small crowd of maybe 15 or 16 people, mostly men, standing aimlessly in a wide semicircle around him. They kept the distance, like rubberneckers at a car wreck, behind an invisible police line. They stared at him, silently, not much in their faces. He stared back. He let his gaze rest on each one in turn, several seconds at a time. He kept his arms hitched as high behind him as he could manage. He wanted to keep his feet free for action, in case any of them felt like starting the show a little early. She smelled the first sentry before she saw him. He was moving upwind toward her, smoking. The odor of the cigarette and the unwashed uniform drifted down to her and she pulled silently to her right. She looped a wide circle around him and waited. He walked on down the hill and was gone. The second sentry heard her. She sensed it, sensed him stopping and listening. She stood still, thought hard. She didn't want to use the Ingram. It was too inaccurate. She was certain to miss with it. And the noise would be fatal. So she bent down and scratched up two small stones. An old jungle trick she had been told about as a child. She tossed the first stone 20 feet to her left. Waited. Tossed the second 30 feet. She heard the sentry figure something was moving slowly away to the left. Heard him drift in that direction. She drifted right, a wide circle, and onward, up the endless hill. Fowler shouldered through the small semicircle of onlookers. Stepped up face to face with him. Stared hard at him. Then six guards were coming through the crowd. Five of them had rifles leveled and the sixth had a length of chain in his hand. Fowler stood aside and the five rifles jammed hard into Reach's gut. He glanced down at them. The safety catchers were off and they were all set to automatic fire. Time to go, Fowler said. He vanished behind the sturdy trunk and Reacher felt the cuffs come off. He leaned forward off the tree and the muzzles tracked back, following the motion. Then the cuffs went back on, with the chain looped into them. Fowler gripped the chain and Reacher was dragged through the bastion, facing the five guards. They were all walking backward, their rifles leveled a foot from his head. People were lined into a tight cordon. He was dragged between them. The people hissed and muttered at him as he passed. Then they broke ranks and ran ahead of him, up toward the parade ground. The third sentry caught her. Her knee let her down. She had to scale a high rocky crag, and because of her leg, she had to do it backward. She sat on the rock like it was a chair and used her good leg and the crutch to push herself upward, a foot at a time. She reached the top and rolled over on her back on the ground, gasping from the effort, and then she squirmed upright and stood, face to face with the sentry. For a split second, she was blank with surprise and shock. He wasn't. He had stood at the top of the bluff and watched every inch of her agonizing progress. So he wasn't surprised. But he was slow. An opponent like Holly, he should have been quick. He should have been ready. Her reaction clicked in before he could get started. Basic training took over. It came without thinking. She balled her fist and threw a fast low uppercut. Caught him square in the groin. He folded forward and down and she wrapped her left arm around his throat and crunched him in the back of his neck with her right forearm. She felt his vertebrae smash and his body go slack. 
Then she clamped her palms over his ears and twisted his head around, savagely, one way and then the other. His spinal cord severed and she turned him and dropped him over the crag. He thumped and crashed his way down over the rocks, dead limbs flailing. Then she cursed and swore, bitterly. Because she should have taken his rifle. It was worth a dozen ingrams. But there was no way she was going to climb all the way down to get it. Climbing back up again would delay her too long. The parade ground was full of people, all standing in neat ranks. Reacher guessed there were maybe a hundred people there. Men and women, all in uniform, all armed. Their weapons formed a formidable array of firepower. Each person had either a fully automatic rifle or a machine gun slung over their left shoulder. Each person had an automatic pistol on their belt. They all had ammunition pouches and grenades hung regulation style from loops on their webbing. Many of them had smeared night camouflage on their faces. The uniforms were adapted from U.S. Army surplus. Camouflage jackets, camouflage pants, jungle boots, forage caps. Same stuff as Reacher had seen piled up in the storehouse. But each uniform had additions. Each jacket had an immaculate shoulder flash, woven in maroon silk, spelling out Montana militia in an elegant curve. Each jacket had the wearer's name stenciled onto olive tape and sewn above the breast pocket. Some of the men had single chromium stars punched through the fabric on the breast pocket. Some kind of rank. Boborkan was standing on an upturned wooden crate, west edge of the leveled area, his back to the forest, his massive bulk looming over his troops. He saw Fowler and Reacher and the guards arriving through the trees. Attention, he called. There was a shuffling as the hundred militia members snapped into position. Reacher caught a smell of canvas on the breeze. The smell of a hundred army surplus uniforms. Borkin waved a bloated arm and Fowler used the chain to drag Reacher up toward the front of the gathering. The guard seized his arms and shoulders and he was turned and maneuvered so he was left standing next to the box, suddenly isolated, facing the crowd. We all know why we're here, Borkin called out to them. She had no idea how far she had come. It felt like miles, hundreds of feet uphill, but she was still deep in the woods. The main track was still 40 yards south on her left. She felt the minutes ticking away and her panic rising. She gripped the crutch and moved on northwest again, as fast as she dared. Then she saw a building ahead of her, a wooden hut, visible through the trees. The undergrowth petered out into stony shale. She crept to the edge of the wood and stopped. Listened hard over the roar of her breathing. Heard nothing. She gripped the crutch and raised the ingram tight against the strap. Limped across the shell to the corner of the hut. Looked out and around. It was the clearing where they had arrived the night before. A wide circular space. Stony. Ringed with huts. Deserted. Quiet. The absolute silence of a recently abandoned place. She came out from behind the hut and limped to the center of the clearing, pirouetting on her crutch, jabbing the ingram in a wide circle, covering the trees on the perimeter. Nothing. Nobody there. She saw two paths, one running west, a wider track running north. She swung north and headed back into the cover of the trees. She forgot all about trying to stay quiet and raced north as fast as she could move. We all know why we're here, Borkin called out again. The orderly crowd shuffled, and a wave of whispering rose to the trees. Reacher scanned the faces. He saw Stevie in the front rank. A chromium star through his breast pocket. Little Stevie was an officer. Next to Stevie he saw Joseph Ray. Then he realized Jackson was not there. No scarred forehead. He double-checked, scanned everywhere. No sign of him anywhere on the parade ground. He clamped his teeth to stop a smile. Jackson was hiding out. Holly might still make it. She saw him. She stared out of the forest over a hundred heads and saw him standing next to Borkin. His arms were cuffed behind him. He was scanning the crowd. Nothing in his face. She heard Borkin say, we all know why we're here. She thought, yes, I know why I'm here. I know exactly why I'm here. She looked left and right. A hundred people, rifles, machine guns, pistols, grenades. Borkin on the box with his arms raised. Reacher, helpless beside him. She stood in the trees, heart thumping, staring. Then she took a deep breath. Set the ingram to the single shot position and fired into the air. Burst out of the trees. 
fired again, and again, three shots into the air. Three bullets gone, twenty-seven left in the magazine. She kicked the Ingram back to full auto and moved into the crowd, parting it in front of her with slow menacing sweeps of her gun hand. She was one woman moving slowly through a crowd of a hundred people. They parted warily around her, and then as she passed them by, they unslung their weapons and cocked them and leveled them at her back. A wave of loud mechanical noises trailed behind her like a slow tide. By the time she reached the front rank, she had a hundred loaded weapons trained on her from behind. Don't shoot her, Borkin screamed, that's an order, nobody fire. He jumped down off the box. Panic in his face. He raised his arms out wide and danced desperately around her, shielding her body with his huge bulk. Nobody fired. She limped away from him and turned to face the crowd. Hell are you doing? Borkin screamed at her. You think you can suit a hundred people with that little pop gun? Holly shook her head. No, she said quietly. Then she reversed the Ingram and held it to her chest. But I can shoot myself, she said. The crowd was silent. Their breathing was swallowed up by the awesome mountain silence. Everybody was staring at Holly. She was holding the Ingram reversed, the muzzle jammed into a spot above her heart. Thumb backward on the trigger, tensed. Borkin's bloated face was greased with panic. His huge frame was shaking and trembling. He was hopping around next to his upturned box, staring wide-eyed at her. She was looking back at him, calmly. I'm a hostage, right? She said to him, important to them, important to you, because of who I am. All kinds of importance to all kinds of people. You expect them to do stuff to keep me alive. So now it's your turn. Let's talk about what stuff you're prepared to do to keep me alive. Borkin saw her glance at Reacher. You don't understand, he screamed at her. Wild urgency in his voice. I'm not going to kill this guy. This guy stays alive. The situation has changed. Changed how? She asked, calmly. I'm commuting his sentence, Borkin said. Still panic in his voice. That's why we're here. I was just going to announce it. We know who he is. We just found out. We were just informed. He was in the army. Major Jack Reacher. He's a hero. He won the Silver Star. So, Holly asked. He saved a bunch of Marines, Borkin said urgently. In Beirut. Ordinary fighting men. He pulled them out of a burning bunker. Marines will never attack us while he's here. Never. So I'm going to use him as another hostage. He's good insurance, against the damn Marines. I need him. She stared at him. Reacher stared at him. His sentence is commuted, Borkin said again. Five years on punishment detail. That's all. Nothing else. No question about it. I need him alive. He stared at her with a salesman's beam like the problem was solved. She stared back and forth between him and Reacher. Reacher was watching the crowd. The crowd was angry. The circus had left town before the performance. Reacher felt like they had all taken a step toward him. They were testing Borkin's power over them. Holly glanced at him, fear in her eyes. Nodded to him, an imperceptible movement of her head. She would be safe, she was saying, whatever happened. Her identity protected her like an invisible magic cloak. Reacher nodded back. Without turning around, he judged the distance to the trees behind him. Maybe twenty feet. Shove Fowler at the front rank, drag the chain, sprint like hell, he might be in the trees before anybody could aim a weapon. Twenty feet, standing start, using the momentum of shouldering Fowler away to help him, maybe four or five strides, maybe three seconds, maybe four. In the trees, he would stand a chance against the bullets. He imagined them smacking into the trunks either side of him as he ran and dodged. A forest is a fugitive's best friend. It takes a lot of luck to hit a guy running through trees. He shifted his weight and felt his hamstrings tighten. Felt the flood of adrenaline. Fight or flight. But then Borkin flung his arms wide again. Held him out like an angel's wings and used the awesome power of his eyes on his people. I have made my decision, he called. Do you understand? There was a long pause. It went on for seconds. Then a hundred heads snapped back. Yes sir, a hundred voices yelled. Do you understand? He called again. A hundred heads snapped back again. Yes sir, a hundred voices yelled. Five years on punishment detail, Borkin called. But only if he can prove who he is. 
We are informed this man is the only non-Marine in history to win the Marine Sniper competition. We are told this man can put six bullets through a silver dollar a thousand yards away. So I'm going to shoot against him. 800 yards. If he wins, he lives. If he loses, he dies. Do you understand? A hundred heads snapped back. Yes sir, a hundred voices yelled. The rumble from the crowd started up again. This time, they sounded interested. Reacher smiled inwardly. Smart move, he thought. They wanted a spectacle, Borkin was giving them one. Fowler breathed out and pulled a key from his pocket. Ducked around and unlocked the handcuffs. The chain fell to the floor. Reacher breathed out and rubbed his wrists. Then Fowler stepped over to Holly in the press of people. Stepped right in front of her. She paused for a long moment and glanced at Borkin. He nodded. You have my word, he said, with as much dignity as he could recover. She glanced at Reacher. He shrugged and nodded. She nodded back and looked down at the Ingram. Ticked the safety on and looped the strap off her shoulder. Grinned and dropped the gun to the floor. Fowler bent at her feet and scooped it up. Borkin raised his arms for quiet. To the rifle range, he called out. Orderly fashion. Dismiss. Holly limped over and walked next to Reacher. You won the Wimbledon? She asked quietly. He nodded. So can you win this? She asked. He nodded again. With my head in a bag, he said. Is that such a good idea? She asked quietly. Guy like this, he's not going to be happy to get beat. Reacher shrugged. He wants a big performance, he's going to get one, he said. He's all shaken up. You started it. I want to keep it going. Long run, it'll do us good. Well, take care, she said. Watch me, Reacher said. Two brand new targets were placed side by side at the extreme end of the range. Borkins was on the left, with ATF daubed across its chest. Reacher's was on the right, with FBI over its heart. The rough matting was pulled back to give maximum distance. Reacher figured he was looking at about 830 yards. 50 yards shy of a full half mile. A hell of a long way. The swarm of people had settled into a rough semicircle, behind and beside the matting. The nearer targets were flung into the undergrowth to clear their view. Several people had field glasses. They peered up the range and then their noise faded as one after the other they settled into quiet anticipation. Fowler made the trip to the armory in the clearing below. He walked back with a rifle in each hand. One for Borkin, one for Reacher. Identical guns. The price of a small family car in each hand. They were 0.50-inch Barrett Model 90s. Nearly four feet long, over 22 pounds in weight. Bolt-action repeaters, fired a bullet a full half-inch across. More like an artillery shell than a rifle bullet. One magazine each, Borkin said. Six shots. Reacher took his weapon and laid it on the ground at his feet. Little Stevie marshaled the crowd backward to clear. The matting. Borkin checked his rifle and flicked the bipod legs out. Smacked the magazine into place. He set the weapon down gently on the matting. I shoot first, he said. He dropped to his knees and forced his bulk down behind the rifle. Pulled the stock to him and snuggled it in close. Dragged the bipod legs an inch to the left and swung the butt a fraction to the right. He smacked the bolt in and out and pressed himself close to the ground. Eased his cheek against the stock and put his eye to the scope. Joseph Ray stepped from the edge of the crowd and offered Reacher his field glasses. Reacher nodded silently and took them. Held them ready. Borkin's finger tightened against the trigger. He fired the first shot. The Barrett's huge muzzle brake blasted gas sideways and downward. Dust blasted back up off the matting. The rifle kicked and boomed. The sound crashed through the trees and came back off the mountains, seconds later. A hundred pairs of eyes flicked from Borkin to the target. Reacher raised the field glasses and focused 830 yards up the range. It was a miss. The target was undamaged. Borkin peered through the scope and grimaced. He hunkered down again and waited for the dust to clear. Reacher watched him. Borkin was just waiting. Steady breathing. Relaxed. Then his finger tightened again. He fired the second shot. The rifle kicked and crashed and the dust blasted upward. Reacher raised the field glasses again. A hit. There was a splinted hole on the target's right shoulder. There was a murmur from the crowd. 
Field glasses were passed from hand to hand. The whispers rose and fell. The dust settled. Borkin fired again. Too quickly. He was still wriggling. Reacher watched him making the mistake. He didn't bother with the field glasses. He knew that half-inch shell would end up in Idaho. The crowd whispered. Borkin glared through the scope. Reacher watched him do it all wrong. His relaxation was disappearing. His shoulders were tensed. He fired the fourth. Reacher handed the field glasses back to Joseph Ray on the edge of the crowd. He didn't need to look. He knew Borkin was going to miss with the rest. In that state, he'd have missed at 400 yards. He'd have missed at 200. He'd have missed across a crowded room. Borkin fired the fifth and then the sixth and stood up slowly. He lifted the big rifle and used the scope to check what everybody already knew. One hit, he said. He lowered the rifle and looked across at Reacher. Your shot, he said. Life or death. Reacher nodded. Fowler handed him his magazine. Reacher used his thumb to test the spring. He pressed down on the first bullet and felt the smooth return. The bullets were shiny, polished by hand. Sniper's bullets. He bent and lifted the heavy rifle. Held it vertical and clicked the magazine into place. He didn't smack at it, like Borkin had done. He pressed it home gently with his palm. He opened the bipod legs, one at a time. Ticked them against the detents. Glanced up the range and laid the rifle on the matting. Squatted next to it and lay down, all in one fluid motion. He lay like a dead man, arms flung upward around the gun. He wanted to lie like that for a long time. He was tired, deathly tired, but he stirred and laid his cheek gently against the stock, snuggled his right shoulder close to the butt, clamped his left hand over the barrel, fingers under the scope, eased his right hand toward the trigger, moved his right eye to the scope, breathed out. Firing a sniper rifle over a long distance is a confluence of many things. It starts with chemistry. It depends on mechanical engineering. It involves optics and geophysics and meteorology. Governing everything is human biology. The chemistry is about explosions. The powder behind the bullet in the shell case has to explode perfectly, predictably, powerfully. It has to smash the projectile down the barrel at maximum speed. The half-inch bullet in the Barrett chamber weighs a hair over two ounces. One minute it's stationary. A thousandth of a second later, it's doing nearly 1900 miles an hour, leaving the barrel behind on its way to the target. That powder has to explode fast, explode completely, and explode hard. Difficult chemistry. Wait for wait, that explosion has got to be the best explosion on the planet. Then mechanical engineering takes over for a spell. The bullet itself has to be a perfect little artifact. It's got to be as good as any manufactured article has ever been. It has got to be cast better than any jewelry. It must be totally uniform in size and weight. Perfectly round, perfectly streamlined. It has to accept ferocious rotation from the rifling grooves inside the barrel. It has to spin and hiss through the air with absolutely no wobble, no bias. The barrel has to be tight and straight. No good at all if a previous shot has heated and altered the barrel shape. The barrel has to be a mass of perfect metal, heavy enough to remain inert. Heavy enough to kill the tiny vibrations of the bolt and the trigger and the firing pin. That's why the Barrett Reacher was holding cost as much as a cheap sedan. That's why Reacher's left hand was loosely clamped over the top of the gun. He was damping any residual shock with it. Optics play a big part. Reach's right eye was an inch behind a loophole and Stevens scope. A fine instrument. The target was showing small, behind the fine data lines etched into the glass. Reacher stared hard at it. Then he eased the stock down and saw the target disappear and the sky swim into view. He breathed out again and stared at the air. Because geophysics are crucial, light travels in a straight line. But it's the only thing that does. Bullets don't. Bullets are physical things which obey the laws of nature, like any other physical things. They follow the curvature of the Earth. 830 yards is a significant piece of curvature. The bullet comes out of the barrel and rises above the line of sight, then it passes through it, then it falls below it. In a perfect curve, like the Earth. Except it's not a perfect curve, because the very first millisecond the bullet is gone, gravity is plucking at it like a small insistent hand. 
The bullet can't ignore it. It's a two-ounce copper-jacketed lead projectile traveling at nearly 1900 miles an hour, but gravity has its way. Not very successfully, at first, but its best ally soon chips in. Friction. From the very first millisecond of its travel, air friction is slowing the bullet down and handing gravity a larger and larger say in its destiny. Friction and gravity work together to haul that bullet down. So you aim way high. You aim maybe 10 feet directly above the target and 830 yards later the curvature of the earth and the pull of its gravity bring that bullet home to where you want it. Except you don't aim directly above the target. Because that would be to ignore meteorology. Bullets travel through air, and air moves. It's a rare day when the air is still. The air moves one way or another. Left or right, up or down, or any combination. Reacher was watching the leaves on the trees, and he could see a slow steady breeze coming out of the north. Dry air, moving slowly right to left across his line of sight. So he was aiming about 8 feet to the right and 10 feet above where he wanted to put the bullet. He was going to launch that projectile and let nature curve it left and down. Human biology was all that stood in the way. Snipers are people. People are quivering, shuddering masses of flesh and muscle. The heart is beating away like a giant pump, and the lungs are squeezing huge volumes of air in and out. Every nerve and every muscle is trembling with microscopic energy. Nobody is ever still. Even the calmest person is vibrating like crazy. Say there's a yard between the rifle's firing pin and the muzzle. If the muzzle moves a tiny fraction, then 830 yards later, the bullet is going to miss by 830 tiny fractions. A multiplying effect. If the shooter's vibration disturbs the muzzle by even a hundredth of an inch, the bullet will be 8.3 inches off target. About the width of a man's head. So Reach's technique was to wait. Just to gaze through the sight until his breathing was regular and his heartbeat was slow. Then to tighten the trigger finger slowly and wait some more. Then to count the heartbeats. One and two and three and four. Keep on waiting until the rhythm was slow. Then to fire between beats. Right when the vibration was as small as a human being could get it. He waited. He breathed out, long and slow. His heart beat once. It beat again. He fired. The stock jumped against his shoulder and his view was obliterated by the blast of dust from the matting under the muzzle. The heavy thump of the shot crashed off the mountainsides and came back to him with a wave of whispering from the crowd. He had missed. The running, crouching screen print with FBI daubed on its chest was undamaged. He let the dust settle and checked the trees. The wind was steady. He breathed out and let his heart rate drop. He fired again. The big rifle kicked and crashed. The dust flew. The crowd stared and whispered. Another miss. Two misses. He breathed steadily and fired again. A miss. And again. Another miss. He paused for a long time. Picked. Up his rhythm again and fired the fifth. He missed the fifth. The crowd was restless. Orkin lumbered nearer. All on the last shot, he said, grinning. Reacher made no reply. No way could he afford the physical disturbance involved in speaking. The disruption to his breathing, the muscular contraction of his lungs and throat would be fatal. He waited. His heart beat. And again. He fired the sixth. He missed. He dropped the sight and stared at the plywood target. Undamaged. Borken was staring at him. Questions in his eyes. Reacher got to his knees and lifted the rifle. Snapped the empty magazine out. Pushed the bolt home. Traced a finger along the neat engraving on the side of the stock. Folded the bipod legs. Laid the warm gun neatly on the matting. He stood up and shrugged. Borkin stared at him. Glanced at Fowler. Fowler glanced back, puzzled. They had watched a man shooting for his life, and they had watched him miss every shot. You knew the rules, Borkin said quietly. Reacher stood still, ignored him, gazed up at the blue sky. A pair of vapor trails were crawling across it, like tiny chalk lines far overhead in the stratosphere. Wait, sir, Joseph Ray called loudly. He came forward out of the crowd, bristling with urgency, self-important, things to say. He was one of the few men in the bastion with any actual military service behind him, and he prided himself on seeing things that other people missed. He thought it gave him an edge, made him useful in special ways. 
He looked hard at the matting and lay himself down exactly where Reacher had lain. Glanced down the range to the targets. Closed one eye and stared through half his field glasses like a telescope. Focused on the screen print of the running man. Moved his line of sight a fraction and focused. Just beyond the hunch of the target's shoulder. Stared into the distance and nodded to himself. Come on, he said. He got to his feet and started jogging down the range. Fowler went with him. 830 yards later, Ray passed the target without a second glance. Kept on jogging. Fowler followed. 50 yards. A hundred. Ray dropped to his knees and stared backward. Aligned himself with the target and the matting, way back in the far distance. Turned and pointed forward, using his whole arm and finger like a rifle barrel. Stood up again and walked 50 more yards to a particular tree. It was an orphan silver birch. A straggly wild survivor, forcing its way up alongside the tall pines. Its trunk was contorted as it fought for light and air, one way and then the next. It was narrow, not more than seven or eight inches across. Six feet from the ground, it had six bullet holes in it. Big fresh half-inch holes. Three of them were in a perfect straight vertical line maybe seven inches high. The other three were curled in a loose curve to the right, running from the top hole out and back to the middle hole and out and back again to the bottom hole. Joseph Ray stared hard at them. Then he realized what they were. He grinned. The six holes made a perfect capital B, right there on the white bark. The letter covered an area of maybe seven inches by five, about the dimensions of a fat man's face. Fowler shouldered past Ray and turned and leaned on the trunk. Stood and pressed the back of his head against the ragged holes. Raised his field glasses and looked back down the range toward the matting. He figured he was more than a hundred and fifty yards behind the target. The target had been more than eight hundred yards from the matting. He did the math in his head. A thousand yards, he breathed. Fowler and Joseph Ray paced it out together on the way back to Borken. Ray kept his stride long, just about exactly a yard. Fowler counted. 990 strides, 990 yards. Borkin knelt on the matting and used Ray's field glasses. He closed one eye and stared across the distance. He could barely even see the white tree. Reacher watched him try to keep the surprise out of his face. Thought to himself, you wanted a big performance, you got one. You like it, fat boy. Okay, Borkin said. So let's see how damn smart you're going to act now. The five guards that had been six when Jackson was with them formed up in a line. They moved forward and took up position around Reacher and Holly. The crowd started filing away quietly. Their feet crunched and slid on the stony ground. Then that sound was gone and the rifle range was quiet. Fowler stopped and picked up the guns. He hefted one in each hand and walked away through the trees. The five guards unslung their weapons with the loud sound of palms slapping on wood and metal. Okay, Borkin said again. Punishment detail. He turned to Holly. You too, he said. You're not too damn valuable for that. You can help him. He's got a task to perform for me. The guards stepped forward and marched Reacher and Holly behind Borkin. Slowly down through the trees to the bastion and on along the beaten earth track to the command hut clearing. They halted there. Two of the guards peeled off and walked to the stores. They were back within five minutes with their weapons shouldered. The first guard was carrying a long-handled shovel in his left hand and a crowbar in his right. The second was carrying two olive fatigue shirts. Borkin took them from him and turned to face Reacher and Holly. Take your shirts off, he said. Put these on. Holly stared at him. Why, she said. Borkin smiled. All part of the game, he said. You're not back by nightfall, we turn the dogs loose. They need your old shirts for the scent. Holly shook her head. I'm not undressing, she said. Borkin looked at her and nodded. We'll turn our backs, he said. But you only get one chance. You don't do it, these boys will do it for you, okay? He gave the command and the five guards fanned out in a loose arc, facing the trees. Borkin waited for Reacher to turn away and then swiveled on his heels and stared up in the air. Okay, he said, get on with it. The men heard unbuttoning sounds and the rasp of cotton. 
They heard the old shirt fall to the ground and the new one sipping on. They heard fingernails clicking against buttons. Done, Holly muttered. Reacher took off his jacket and his shirt and shivered in the mountain breeze. He took the new shirt from Borken and shrugged it on. Sung the jacket over his shoulder. Borken nodded and the guard handed Reacher the shovel and the crowbar. Borken pointed into the forest. Walk due west a hundred yards, he said. Then north another hundred. You'll know what to do when you get there. Holly looked at Reacher. He looked back and nodded. They strolled together into the trees, heading west. Thirty yards into the woods, as soon as they were out of sight, Holly stopped. She planted her crutch and waited for Reacher to turn and rejoin her. Borken, she said, I know who he is. I've seen his name in our files. They tagged him for a robbery, Northern California somewhere. Twenty million dollars in bearer bonds. Armored car driver was killed. Sacramento office investigated, but they couldn't make it stick. Reacher nodded. He did it, he said. That's for damn sure. Fowler admitted it. Says they've got 20 million in the Caymans. Captured from the enemy. Holly grimaced. It explains the mole in Chicago, she said. Borken can afford a pretty handsome bribe with 20 million bucks in the bank, right? Reacher nodded again, slowly. Anybody you know would take a bribe, he asked. She shrugged. They all bitch about the salary, she said. He shook his head. No, he said. Think of somebody who doesn't bitch about it. Whoever's got Borken's bearer bonds behind him isn't worried about money anymore. Some of them don't grumble, she said. Some of them just put up with it. Like me, for instance. But I guess I'm different. He looked at her, walked on. You're different, he repeated. That's for damn sure. He said it vaguely, thinking about it. They walked on for ten yards. He was walking slower than his normal pace and she was limping at his side. He was lost in thought. He was hearing Borken's high voice claiming, she's more than his daughter. He was hearing her own exasperated voice asking, why the hell does everybody assume everything that ever happens to me is because of who my damn father is? Then he stopped walking again and looked straight at her. Who are you, Holly? he asked. You know who I am, she said. He shook his head again. No, I don't, he said. At first I thought you were just some woman. Then you were some woman called Holly Johnson. Then you were an FBI agent. Then you were General Johnson's daughter. Then Borken told me you're even more than that. She's more than his daughter, he said. That stunt you pulled, he was shitting himself. You're some kind of a triple a gold-plated hostage, Holly. So who the hell else are you? She looked at him, sighed. Long story, she said. Started 28 years ago. My father was made a White House fellow. Seconded to Washington. They used to do that, with the fast track guys. He got friendly with another guy. Political analyst, aiming to be a congressman. My mother was pregnant with me, his wife was pregnant, he asked my parents to be godparents, my father asked them to be godparents. So this other guy stood up at my christening. And, Reacher said, the guy got into a career, Holly said. He's still in Washington, you probably voted for him. He's the president. Reacher walked on in a daze. Kept glancing at Holly, gamely matching him stride for stride. A hundred yards west of the punishment hut, there was an outcrop of rock, bare of trees. Reacher and Holly turned there and walked north, into the breeze. Where are we going? Holly said. Her voice had an edge of worry. Reacher stopped suddenly. He knew where they were going. The answer was on the breeze. He went cold. His skin crawled. He stared down at the implements in his hands like he'd never seen such things before. You stay here, he said. She shook her head. No, she said. I'm coming with you, wherever it is. Please, Holly, he said. Stay here, will you? She looked surprised by his voice, but she kept on shaking her head. I'm coming with you, she said again. He gave her a bleak look and they walked on north. He forced himself onward, toward it. Fifty yards. Each step required a conscious effort of will. Sixty yards. He wanted to turn and run. Just run and never stop. Hurl himself across the wild river and get the hell out. Seventy yards. He stopped. Stay here, Holly, he said again. Please. Why? She asked. You don't need to see this, he said, miserably. She shook her head again and walked on. He caught her up. They smelled it long before they saw it. 
Faint, sweet, unforgettable. One of the most common and one of the most terrible smells in mankind's long and awful history. The smell of fresh human blood. Twenty paces after they smelled it, they heard it. The buzzing of a million flies. Jackson was crucified between two young pines. His hands had been dragged apart and nailed to the trees through the palms and wrists. He had been forced up onto his toes and his feet had been nailed flat against the base of the trunks. He was naked and he had been mutilated. He had taken several minutes to die. Reacher was clear on that. He stood immobile, staring at the crawling mass of blue shiny flies. Holly had dropped her crutch and her face was white. Ghastly staring white, she fell to her knees and wretched. Spun herself away from the dreadful sight and fell forward on her face. Her hands clawed blindly in the forest dirt. She bucked and screamed into the buzzing forest silence screamed and cried. Reacher watched the flies. His eyes were expressionless. His face was impassive. Just a tiny muscle jumping at the corner of his jaw gave anything away. He stood still for several minutes. Holly went silent, on the forest floor beside him. He dropped the crowbar, slung his jacket over a low branch, stepped over directly in front of the body and started digging. He dug with a quiet fury. He smashed the shovel into the earth as hard as he could. He chopped through tree roots with single savage blows. When he hit rocks, he heaved him out and hurled them into a pile. Holly sat up and watched him. She watched the blazing eyes in his impassive face and the bulging muscles in his arms. She followed the relentless rhythm of the shovel. She said nothing. The work was making him hot. The flies were checking him out. They left Jackson's body and buzzed around his head. He ignored them, just strained and gasped his way six feet down into the earth. Then he propped the shovel against a tree, wiped his face on his sleeve, didn't speak, took the crowbar and stepped close to the corpse, batted away the flies, levered the nails out of the left hand. Jackson's body flopped sideways, the left arm pointed grotesquely down into the pit. The flies rose in an angry cloud. Reacher walked around to the right hand pried the nails out. The body flopped forward into the hole. Reacher extracted the nails from the feet. The body tumbled free into the grave. The air was dark with flies and loud with their sound. Reacher slid down into the hole and straightened the corpse out, crossed the arms over the chest. He climbed back out. Without pausing he picked up the shovel and started filling the hole. He worked relentlessly. The flies disappeared. He worked on. There was too much dirt. It mounded up high when he had finished, like graves always do. He pounded the mound into a neat shape and dropped the shovel. Bent and picked up the rocks he'd cleared. Used them to shore up the sides of the mound. Placed the biggest one on top, like some kind of a headstone. Then he stood there, panting like a wild man, streaked with dirt and sweat. Holly watched him. Then she spoke for the first time in an hour. Should we say a prayer? She asked. Reacher shook his head. Way too late for that, he said quietly. You okay? She asked. Who's the mole? He asked in turn. I don't know, she said. Well, think about it, will you? He said, angrily. She glared up at him. Don't you think I have been? She said. What the hell else do you think I was doing for the last hour? So who the hell is it? He asked. Still angry. She paused, went quiet again. Could be anybody, she said. There are a hundred agents in Chicago. She was sitting on the forest floor, small, miserable, defeated. She had trusted her people. She had told him that. She had been full of naive confidence. I trust my people, she had said. He felt a wave of tenderness for her. It crashed over him. Not pity, not concern, just an agonizing tenderness for a good person whose bright new world was suddenly dirty and falling apart. He stared at her, hoping she would see it. She stared back, eyes full of tears. He held out his hands. She took them. He lifted her to her feet and held her. He lifted her off the ground and crushed her close. Her breasts were against his pounding chest. Her tears were against his neck. Then her hands were behind his head, pulling him close. She squirmed her face up and kissed him. She kissed him angrily and hungrily on the mouth. Her arms were locking around his neck. He felt her wild breathing. He knelt and laid her gently on the soft earth. Her hands burrowed at his shirt buttons. His at hers. 
They made love naked on the forest floor, urgently, passionately, greedily, as if they were defying death itself. Then they lay panting and spent in each other's arms, gazing up at the sunlight spearing down through the leaves. He stroked her hair and felt her breathing slow down. He held her silently for a long time, watching the dust modes dancing in the sunbeams over her head. Who knew your movements on Monday? He asked softly. She thought about it, made no reply. And which of them didn't know about Jackson then? He asked. No reply. And which of them isn't short of money? He asked. No reply. And which of them is recent? He asked. Which of them could have come close enough to Boborkan somewhere to get bought off? Sometime in the past. Maybe investigating the robbery thing in California. She shuddered in his arms. Four questions, Polly, he said. Who fits? She ran through all the possibilities. Like a process of elimination. An algorithm. She boiled the hundred names down. The first question eliminated most of them. The second question eliminated a few more. The third question eliminated a handful. It was the fourth question which proved decisive. She shuddered again. Only two possibilities, she said. Milosevic and Brogan were strapped side by side in the rear of the Air Force chopper. McGrath and Johnson and the general's aide were crushed into the middle row of seats. The aircrew were shoulder to shoulder in the front. They lifted off from Silver Bow and clattered away northwest over the town of Butte, nose down, low altitude, looking for maximum airspeed. The helicopter was an old Bell, rebuilt with a new engine, and it was pushing 120 miles an hour, which made for a lot of noise inside. Consequently McGrath and Johnson were screaming into their radio mics to make themselves understood. McGrath was patched through to the Hoover building. He was trying to talk to Harland Webster. He had one hand cupped over the mic and the other was clamping the earphone to his head. He was talking about the missile unit. He didn't know if Webster was hearing him. He just repeated his message over and over, as loud as he could. Then he flicked the switch and tore off the headset tossed it forward to the co-pilot. Johnson was talking to Peterson. Radio contact had not been restored. He limited himself to requesting an update by secure landline direct to the mobile command post in two hours' time. He failed to decipher the reply. He pulled off his headset and looked a question at McGrath. McGrath shrugged back at him. The helicopter clattered onward. Harland Webster heard the shrieking din cut off. He hung up his phone in the sudden silence of his office. Leaned forward and buzzed his secretary. Car, he said. He walked through to the elevator and rode down to the garage. Walked over to his limousine. His driver was holding the door for him. White House, he said. This time, the driver said nothing. Just fired it up and eased out of the garage. Bumped up and out into the afternoon rush. Called the 1600 yards west in silence. Webster was directed to the same off-white room. He waited there a quarter hour. Dexter came in, clearly not pleased to see him back so soon. They've stolen some missiles, Webster said. What missiles? Dexter asked. He described everything as well as he could. Dexter listened. Didn't nod. Didn't ask any questions. Didn't react. Just told him to wait in the room. The Air Force Bell put down on a gravel turnout 200 yards south of where the road into York narrowed and straightened into the hills. The pilot kept the engine turning and the five passengers ducked out and ran bent over until they were out of the fierce downdraft. There were vehicles on the road ahead. A random pattern of military vehicles slewed across the blacktop. One of them was turning slowly in the road. It turned in the narrow space between the rocky walls and straightened as it approached. It slowed and halted 50 yards away. General Johnson stepped out into view. The car moved forward and stopped in front of him. It was a new Chevrolet, sprayed a dull olive green. There were white stenciled letters and figures on the hood and along the sides. An officer slid out. He saluted the general and skipped around to open all the doors. The five men squeezed in and the car turned again and rolled the 200 yards north to the mess of vehicles. The command post is on its way, sir, the officer said. Should be here inside 40 minutes. The satellite trucks are an hour behind it. I suggest you wait in the car. It's getting cold outside. Word from the missile unit. Johnson asked. The officer shook his head in the gloom. No word, sir, he said. 
Webster waited most of an hour. Then the door of the small off-white room cracked open. A Secret Service agent stood there. Blue suit, curly wire running up out of his collar to his earpiece. Please come with me, sir, the agent said. Webster stood up and the guy raised his hand and spoke into his cuff. Webster followed him along a quiet corridor and into an elevator. The elevator was small and slow. It took them down to the first floor. They walked along another quiet corridor and paused in front of a white door. The agent knocked once and opened it. The president was sitting in his chair behind his desk. The chair was rotated away and he had his back to the room. He was staring out through the bulletproof windows at the darkness settling over the garden. Dexter was in an armchair. Neither asked him to sit down. The president didn't turn around. As soon as he heard the door click shut, he started speaking. Suppose I was a judge, he said, and suppose you were some cop and you came to me for a warrant. Webster could see the president's face reflected in the thick glass. It was just a pink smudge. Okay, sir, suppose I was, he said. What have you got? The president asked him, and what haven't you got? You don't even know for sure Holly's there at all. You've got an undercover asset in place and he hasn't confirmed it to you. You're guessing, he's all. And these missiles. The army has lost radio contact. Could be temporary. Could be any number of reasons for that. Your undercover guy hasn't mentioned them. He could be experiencing difficulties, sir, Webster said. And he's been told to be cautious. He doesn't call in with a running commentary. He's undercover, right. He can't just disappear into the forest any old time he wants to. The president nodded. The pink smudge in the glass moved up and down. There was a measure of sympathy there. We understand that, Harland, he said. We really do. But we have to assume that with matters of this magnitude, he's going to make a big effort, right? But you've heard nothing. So you're giving us nothing but speculation. Webster spread his hands. Spoke directly to the back of the guy's head. Sir, this is a big deal, he said. They're arming themselves, they've taken a hostage, they're talking about secession from the Union. The president nodded. Don't you understand, that's the problem. He said, if this were about three weirdos in a hut in the woods with a bomb, we'd send you in there right away. But it isn't. This could lead to the biggest constitutional crisis since 1860. So you agree with me, Webster said. You're taking him seriously. The president shook his head. Sadly, like he was upset but not surprised Webster didn't get the point. No, he said, we're not taking him seriously. That's what makes this whole thing so damn difficult. There are a bunch of deluded idiots, seeing plots everywhere, conspiracies, muttering about independence for their scrubby little patch of worthless real estate. But the question is, how should a mature democratic nation react to that? Should it massacre them all, Harland? Is that how a mature nation reacts? Should it unleash deadly force against a few deluded idiot citizens? We spent a generation condemning the Soviets for doing that. Are we going to do the same thing? They're criminals, sir, Webster said. Yes, they are, the president agreed, patiently. They're counterfeiters, they own illegal weapons, they don't pay federal taxes, they foment racial hatred, maybe they even robbed an armored car. But those are details, Harland. The broad picture is their disgruntled citizens. And how do we respond to that? We encourage disgruntled citizens in Eastern Europe to stand up and declare their nationhood, right? So how do we deal with our own disgruntled citizens, Harland? Declare war on them. Webster clamped his jaw. He felt adrift, like the thick carpets and the quiet paint and the unfamiliar scented air inside the Oval Office were choking him. They're criminals, he said again. It was all he could think of to say. The president nodded, still a measure of sympathy. Yes, they are, he agreed again. But look at the broad picture, Harland. Look at their main offense. Their main offense is they hate the government. If we deal with them harshly for that, we could face a crisis. Like we said, there are maybe 60 million Americans ready to be tipped over the edge. This administration is very aware of that, Harland. This administration is going to tread very carefully. But what about Holly? He asked. You can't just sacrifice her. There was a long silence. The president kept his chair turned away. I can't react because of her, either, he said quietly. I can't allow myself to make this personal. 
Don't you see that? A personal, emotional, angry response would be wrong. It would be a bad mistake. I have to wait and think. I've talked it over with the general. We've talked for hours. Frankly, Harland, he's pissed at me. And again frankly, I don't blame him. He's just about my oldest friend. And he's pissed at me. So don't talk to me about sacrifice, Harland. Because sacrifice is what this office is all about. You put the greater good in front of friendship, in front of all your own interests. You do it all the time. It's what being president means. There was another long silence. So what are you saying to me, Mr. President? Webster asked. Another long silence. I'm not saying anything to you, the president said. I'm saying you're in personal command of the situation. I'm saying come see Mr. Dexter Monday morning, if there's still a problem.